Hello and welcome to Audiovisual Cultures Podcast. I'm Paula Blair and in this edition I wanted to read you another of my published essays. Early on in the UK lockdown, I was proactive in getting attention from potential guests, but people are busy and they're trying to get a handle on working from home while also homeschooling, and so plans remain in the works with some people. In the meantime, while I'm getting other things organised, I thought it would be useful to revisit a little of my work on Northern Ireland because the broad strokes themes in my Panopticonicity essay are relevant to the whirlwind of current events as I record this in early June 2020. In the UK there is much rhetoric around moving on from coronavirus while we are in the throes of it. In the US there is significant civil unrest from people pushed to breaking point with racial profiling, discrimination, violence and murder. White supremacists and their carbon copies around the world also insist we move on from slavery even while refueling its legacies. The conflict in Northern Ireland in the late 20th century will seem incidental and irrelevant to most of you listening, I have no doubt, but the civil unrest that erupted there in the late 1960s mirrored the civil rights movement in the US and some of the same activists such as Bernadette Devlin McAlisky fought just as hard with the Black Panthers in the US as they did for those treated as second class citizens at home. My essay looks at video installations by Willie Doherty that confront that pressure to move on while the problems holding society in stasis are never resolved. Thank you so much to members on patreon.com forward slash avcultures for all your support. It matters more now than ever and is hugely appreciated. Do listen to the end for other ways of getting in touch and supporting if you can. If you have something you're burning to talk about, I want to hear from you. There's a platform here. It's a very small one, but it is a platform and I please want you to make use of it. For now, I hope this reading provides some food for thought. And just to note, what I'm about to read differs slightly from the published text. A few things were changed and omitted from my final submission without my knowledge, including the epigraph that really sets the tone for the whole piece. So I want to put that back in. I hope you get something out of this. Panopticonicity, Sites of Control and the Failure of Forgetting in Willie Doherty's Rerun 2002 and Drive 2003 and an epigraph from Michel Foucault's essay of Other Spaces. I believe that the anxiety of our era has to do fundamentally with space, no doubt a great deal more than with time. Time probably appears to us only as one of the various disruptive operations that are possible for the elements that are spread out in space. Since December 2012, there have been regular protests over the cessation of the permanent display of the British Union flag on Belfast City Hall and a recorded rise in racial intolerance directed at immigrants in the city. Given this, along with the continued presence of visual markers such as sectarian graffiti and murals, it appears that the anxieties of contemporary urban Northern Ireland are still largely concerned with maintaining territorial spaces and their boundaries. However, these boundaries have not necessarily been shaped by the communities working to uphold them. In his article, Cities Under Watch, Matthew Brown states that since the beginning of the conflict in Northern Ireland, its cities, quote, have long been subjected to the gaze of surveillance technology, a field of vision that endeavours to organise each of these cities into observable units, unquote. Accordingly, urban centres such as Belfast and Derry Londonderry have been continually reshaped in recent decades to facilitate state and paramilitary methods of information gathering. The continual shifts in architecture, including the regenerative city planning during the relative peace time following the 1998 Good Friday Agreement, together with increased accessibility to technologies of watching, also led to marked changes in the behaviour of those who traverse such spaces. 
keeping in mind Michel Foucault's theorising of the panopticon and heterotopia. This chapter examines some of the effects on behaviour and identity when we become aware of being watched within observable and manageable zones. It does this through a discussion of two double channel video installations by Derry born artist Willie Doherty, namely Rerun and Drive. They are works which show how vision and movement in panoptic urban spaces can affect memory processes and experiences that are particular to place, while also exuding an air of placelessness. In working through the function of heterotopias, Foucault suggests that, quote, their role is to create a space that is other, another real space, as perfect, as meticulous, as well arranged, as art is messy, ill-constructed and jumbled, unquote. He continues that this would be a heterotopia, quote, of compensation, unquote, and posits that, quote, certain colonies, unquote, may have operated in this manner in an effort to organise, quote, absolutely perfect other places, unquote. He states that colonies are an extreme type of other space and that, quote, the ship is a heterotopia par excellence. Unquote, in that it is, quote, a place without place, unquote, which is contained yet freely moves amongst the colonies. Northern Ireland is thought to be a place apart, a place that is at once both and neither Irish and British, colonial and post-colonial, conflicted and post-conflict. Given its ambivalent circumstances and mixed identity, it is also a placeless place. The utopian outlook of the heterotopia is perhaps the imaginary place Northern Ireland could be if only it would move on and put its past troubles behind it. An attempt to drive this forward is seen in the dissemination of official narratives in which not everyone's perception of the truth is accounted for. The stipulations of the agreement were not a fit-all solution and society largely remains tethered to an unseen, unresolved past. For example, one contentious condition was the release of all politically motivated prisoners from jail, which has proved problematic for many victims and survivors. It is worth noting that in 2013, the American diplomat and former US Special Envoy to Northern Ireland, Richard Haas, chaired inter-party talks aimed at confronting unresolved issues from the Troubles, particularly how to deal with flags, parading and the past. The five political parties involved, the Democratic Unionist Party, Sinn Féin, the Social Democratic and Labour Party, the Ulster Unionist Party and Alliance, could not come to an agreement and the talks failed. Works such as Rerun and Drive demonstrate that the continued denial of memory only serves to reinforce the shifting architectures of controlled movement through space and encourage forgetting of what was there before. They show that when official forgetting fails and the journey has only arbitrary start and end points, the actions within sites of control are doomed to be repeated over and over. Context and themes The 1960s saw changes in habits of watching thanks to the increased accessibility to television and the growing immediacy of information dissemination made available by television networks. The mediatization of an event can produce multiple views of what was witnessed in real life and what is later seen in fictive or non-fictive representations, creating a tension between subjective memory and the replay of a recording. Not only can alterations be applied to descriptions of an event, this is often done in such a way as to lead the response of the story's receiver while appearing to offer an objective account of it. The process of achieving controlled responses is inherent in the post-production editing of film, whereby the sequencing of events and the positions from which they are depicted can determine viewers' reactions. Given this, it is interesting to consider how video artists utilise the looping device in the exhibition of their work. Collectively, Doherty's video installations make visible the usually hidden media devices that construct viewers' responses to the world around them. In revealing a common susceptibility to accept media manipulations, the artist invites the viewer to question the internal and performative processes of memory and testimony. The ability to interrogate media devices is facilitated by the opportunity to immediately and repeatedly re-watch the work. 
Willie Doherty is a visual artist of international acclaim. He has been nominated for the prestigious Turner Prize on two occasions, once in 1994 for his first video work entitled The Only Good One is a Dead One, 1993, and again in 2003 for Rerun. His photographic series and site-specific video art largely deal with themes and issues which affect society and the landscape during and after conflict. He has held residencies and exhibited his work extensively throughout the UK, Ireland and many countries in Europe, North America and Latin America. In 2007, he was selected to represent Northern Ireland at the Venice Biennale, for which perhaps his most famous video work was commissioned. Ghost Story largely consists of a spectral steadicam shot, which drifts along a pathway flanked by woodland on each side, while a narrator voiced by actor Stephen Ray poetically describes occurrences linked to the events which transpired in Derry on the 30th of January 1972, otherwise known as Bloody Sunday. The pathway and woodland are situated near the city, where as a 12-year-old child Doherty witnessed some of the horrors of that day when British Army paratroopers opened fire on an unauthorised civil rights march, killing 13 people and injuring many more. His pervading memories of this trauma, combined with his exposure to several decades of conflicting responses to and representations of such events in news, broadcast, film and photographic media, permeate the artist's comprehensive body of work, originally a sculptor, a skill which remains evident in the curatorial elements and framing in his work. Doherty moved into photography in the 1980s. His projects involved taking alternative approaches to landscape photography, often by incorporating text with monochrome panoramas or by featuring the physical remnants of unseen acts of violence. A broad theme that has developed in Doherty's work since his early engagements with space and place and which makes his later work so widely accessible is ambivalence. For example, his 1986 image, The Blue Skies of Ulster, is a black and white photograph depicting a barely discernible landscape obscured by mist overlaid with a quotation from the contentious Unionist figure and former Northern Ireland First Minister, Reverend Ian Paisley. Presented in blue block capitals, the text reads, We shall never forsake the blue skies of Ulster for the grey mists of an Irish Republic. Paul O'Brien points out the irony of this statement in that while the colour blue connects Protestantism with British royalism, the red, white and blue of the Union flag, it is also associated with anti-clericalism during the French Revolution. He continues that orange is the colour more typically symbolic of loyalism given its Dutch association, while green represents Irish nationalism and republicanism. O'Brien notes that, quote, historically, republicanism is Protestant in inspiration the American Revolution, while monarchy is, again historically, a Catholic institution, an ironic reversal of northern political alignments." Doherty continued to integrate such ambivalences when he extended his practice to slide set projections and video installations in the 1990s. Many of Doherty's video works give the impression that actions occur within set boundaries, that they are subject to external control. A further aspect of this is the imposition of text or speech against the image, that is the use of specifically chosen language to exert control over the potential meanings evoked by a given image. Writing around the time of the initial exhibitions of rerun, O'Brien draws attention to the quote, postmodern escape of meaning from language, unquote, with reference to works in which Doherty plays with the geopolitics associated with the language of place and direction. The 1988 photograph, The Other Side, features a diagonal split in the panoramic frame between an urban setting on the left and a rural scene on the right. These are respectively overlaid with the statements West is South and East is North, referring to the splits in the cities of Derry and Belfast between their largely Catholic populations in the West, associated with the Republic south of Ireland, and the largely Protestant populations in the East, referring to Northern Ireland's union with Britain. Another irony emerges in that it is Ireland, particularly the western counties, which usually evokes rugged rural landscapes, as is so often seen in indigenous painting and photography. It is interesting then to examine moving image works made by Doherty during the early years following the 1998 agreement that are stripped of spoken and written language, but which are dependent on the viewer's inherent understanding of various aspects of film language. Space and Place 
In her text, The Place of Artists Cinema, Maeve Conley states that Doherty's rerun is characterised by a, quote, pronounced emphasis on visual sensation, and even though it is clearly concerned with repetition and memory, the principal tension evident within the work is spatial, unquote. Doherty's process for new work typically stems from his memories of a specific location or memories of stories connected to certain places. Many of his earlier works deal with the politicisation and codification of landscapes and cityscapes in Northern Ireland, while his post-2000 work deals with space in more conceptual and thematic ways to acknowledge the international audiences who might lack the specialist local knowledge required to fully understand the work and to confront the broader range of human concerns. While Rerun and Drive fit this remit, the locations at which they were made in Derry and Belfast, to be examined shortly, provide an important subtext that makes Doherty's intervention and the actors' performances in the spaces all the more relevant. In addition to their criticism of mediation, the double screen installations Rerun and Drive can be considered as examinations of the body's navigation through urban spaces that simultaneously facilitate and constrict movement within them. This constrained movement is exacerbated in these works by the camera's tight framing of space as well as rapid montage techniques that fragment durational time and the physical body. At the same time, the viewer in the exhibition space experiences an expansion of the film's spaces due to the double screens, positioned to face one another at either side of the room. Here, Doherty imposes on the viewer a choice between two binaries, in that the screens depicting two conflicting versions of the same concepts are positioned so that only one may be viewed at a time. The gallery spectator may experience an effective transference of the performances enforced on the actors in the video installations, performances which are indicative of the external control that derives from architectures which are shaped by ways of seeing and ways of watching. Drive and Rerun are both double channel video installations featuring two rapidly edited versions of men moving through urbanised liminal spaces at night. In Rerun, a youngish man wearing a dark suit and white shirt, Jim Norris, runs across the lower tier of a bridge bathed in red light, while in Drive, a slightly older man, Stuart Graham, drives a car through a motorway tunnel surrounded by vivid green lighting. The separate films in each installation last for 30 seconds and consist of 42 cuts, which means there are 43 separate shots lasting for an average of 0.7 seconds. The short duration of each film is indiscernible in the installation loop. This together with the repetition of shots creates an effect of perpetually repeated actions seen from a repeated sequence of shifting viewpoints. The cinematic language in Rerun and Drive, particularly the frenetic editing and framing of the male characters, gives an impression of external control imposed on the individualised body moving through urban space. The runner and the driver are constantly in frame, although filmed from different distances, with a second screen in both installations depicting an alternative version of the first. They are only shown moving within and never beyond their respective claustrophobic spaces of the lower tier of a bridge and a car's interior as it moves through a tunnel. The sense of constriction in these spaces is heightened by the expressive red and green lighting that floods the images and is punctuated by the overhead lights lining the undercarriage of the bridge's top tier and roof of the tunnel in which these men seem to be trapped. The titles of Rerun and Drive convey action and motion, which is in contrast to some of Doherty's earlier static durational works, for example Black Spot 1997 and Control Zone 1999, were filmed from military vantage points on the Derry walls and consist of static long uncut zoom shots, each lasting for 30 minutes. They monitor the areas contained within the frames, a residential area and a stretch of road and a bridge respectively. 
Nothing notable happens in these videos, but the camera's persistent watchfulness in both instances suggests that unscrupulous activities are expected to occur in these areas at any time. While black spot and control zone configure duration and stasis, rerun and drive are rapidly edited, repetitive, fragmented, non-narrative disruptions of realist filmic representations. When the four works are analysed together, they present tensions between stillness and movement, time and duration. However, it is their use of space and place in relation to memory that is of interest in this study. Significantly, Black Spot watches over the Bogside housing estate in Derry. The Craigavon Bridge, which at once connects and divides the mainly Protestant Loyalist community on the River Foyle's east bank and the largely Catholic Nationalist community on the west bank, features in both Control Zone and Rerun. Finally, the West Link in Belfast serves as the location for drive. Each of these areas performs a quotidian function, yet they have all, at some point, been associated with contentious events that happened during the Northern Ireland conflict. The Craigavon Bridge and the West Link are examples of territorial betweenness, in that both divide and connect communities that embody the two perceived sides of the Troubles. However, this association with place is only made when reading accompanying literature about the exhibitions, so that as abstracted images, shorn from their context in relation to the conflict, these videos look as if they could be situated in any number of post-industrial urban centres. Screened in silence, the suited man in rerun is seen running towards the camera in one channel and away from it in the other. Calling to mind the dual purpose of the two-tiered Craigavon Bridge, the two areas which are connected and divided in this instance are simply where the man is heading to and where he has just been. However, in the film's diegesis, these places are non-existent. He is trapped in a transitory, non-social space between connection and division. For the viewer, his journey is seen over and over from arbitrary rather than actual start and end points. The man has not come from somewhere and is not going anywhere. Instead, he is in a state of constant presentness and transit. Drive, on the other hand, was filmed with the actor driving through a tunnel that is part of the West Link, a vein of the M1 motorway in West Belfast that is the main route used to travel south towards the border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, although we do not know in which direction he is travelling. The lighting and tight framing of the shots through the car's front and side windows gives an oppressive feel to the work. Each sequence consists of wide, mid, close-up and extreme close-up shots of the driver, seen either head-on or from his right. He drives casually in one sequence, while in the other his hands are on the steering wheel but his eyes are closed. It is uncertain whether or not he is asleep or unconscious, but what is clear is that, like the audience, he cannot see the road ahead. Both sequences are accompanied by a short, repetitive sample of light traffic sounds. The seeing and sightless versions of the driver never reach a destination, but rather appear to remain forever on the road. There is more of a sense of constant forward motion in drive, in contrast to the idea of rerunning the same actions in an endless loop. The car and bridge are suggestive of Foucault's notion of other spaces, spaces that are not fixed to a place and which become fully functional when there is a break with traditional time. The car's non-fixedness and the bridge's betweenness perhaps present a degree of freedom, however the car never exits the tunnel and the running man does not seem to be able to reach the other side of the bridge. Foucault states that, quote, heterotopias always presuppose a system of opening and closing that both isolates them and makes them penetrable. In general, the heterotopic site is not freely accessible like a public place, unquote. The car is an other space with penetrable boundaries which happens to be contained by another other space with penetrable boundaries. In this respect, the tunnel and the bridge present a similar obstacle to the city as an ambivalent panoptic space that gives the impression that it facilitates free movement while in fact restricting it. Additionally, this misleading sense of freedom evokes the anxiety of modernity in which there is no room for individuality or autonomous movement through space. Instead, movement is controlled by the architectures of social and political zoning.
Not only have such spaces been continually reshaped by state and paramilitary processes of watching and monitoring the other in cities such as Derry and Belfast, they are also being reshaped by contemporary post-conflict as well as post-industrial regeneration. On this point, Maeve Connolly consults Doherty's awareness that even though his practice has long provided critiques of the conventions of reportage and documentary, many of his works, including Rerun and Drive, nevertheless become documents of these changing landscapes. Whilst regeneration is more positive than the paramilitary reorganisation of civic space, both introduce shifts in urban architectures and remap road infrastructure with the same effect of dictating users' movements through space. In a similar way, the mediatisation of such spaces when they appear in, for example, news broadcasts in a positive or negative light can also facilitate the reshaping of widespread perceptions of the area and potentially affect change in who traverses it and when. In addition to the controlled spaces of the bridge, car and tunnel that are framed on screen, the exhibition space itself exerts control over what can be viewed and how it is viewed. In the earlier black spot and control zone, Doherty allows 30 minutes to examine mundane actions within a static, unblinking frame. Yet in rerun and drive, there are only 30 seconds to examine a barrage of visual information that poses more questions than answers. Rather than overseeing contained areas in which movement happens at a distance, the spectators of the drive and rerun installations are situated amid continuous dual actions and the rapid repetition of different movements occurring simultaneously on two screens. Moreover, two projections appear on opposite screens measuring three by four metres, which are suspended at either end of a dark enclosed space. They are positioned in such a way that only one may be viewed at a time, which makes the viewing experience even more demanding. While the camera work and mise-en-scene in the videos heighten the constriction around the male characters, the adjacent double screens expand the filmic space. This is particularly relevant in rerun as the installation setup makes the suited man look as if he is chasing himself. Given this effect, Conley argues that rerun stages and investigates the experience of off-screen space in a tension that is never resolved. It is the viewer who is charged with negotiating the tension between the screens, an act which produces an unwitting performance in the spectator that again adds to the ambivalent performances of the runner and the driver, who are forever engaged in a presentness of repeatedly navigating the city's non-social public spaces. Identity, Experience and Performance while Doherty's work is still primarily motivated by location rather than character-driven narratives, Jim Fisher points out that much of the artist's post-2000 work questions what kinds of characters or figures would be present in the places and situations in which they are found. There is a distinctly modernist sense of alienation in The Running Man and The Driver. They are stripped of any identity, deeper than the well-dressed white male who is navigating or being steered through the non-social spaces which they occupy. This, in conjunction with how audience members must continually reposition themselves when viewing these works, causes the spectator to feel disorientated. The shape of the space and the lack of identification with the characters undermine any spectatorial authority to which the viewer would normally lay claim. This is accentuated by the disembodied cinematography. The camera often seems devoid of an operator in Doherty's works, Fisher's unseen observer, and therefore its stance or moral position is unclear. When viewing Rerun and Drive, there is an impression that the sequences could be fragments from action scenes or expeditionary moments from film noir, a cinematic genre that exudes moral ambiguity through its expressionistic mise-en-scene and low-angle cinematography. The suited running man's facial expression is hard to read and changes with every cut. He displays a range of feelings such as panic, anxiety, determination, fear, fatigue and urgency. As his actions are repeated in different directions on two screens, his betweenness becomes evident. He is neither here nor there, yet simultaneously coming and going. Although he is isolated on the bridge, his lack of individuality can be perceived. 
Carolyn Christoph Bakker gave argues that the suited man quote is not a specific person but every man not an individual but an emblem something more primary and archaic unquote. The figure in drive could be considered in the same light although he is static in a moving car and not clearly distressed like the running man the images of him driving with his eyes closed project a sense of anxiety onto the viewer which is further aggravated by the rapid editing in this sequence the man embodies the fears inherent in everyday activities in a literal sense falling asleep at the wheel could happen to almost anyone whereas if this image is understood as a psychological metaphor the man represents the fear of going blindly forward into the unknown the desire to identify these men begs consideration in her article entitled Out of Position, Fisher discusses Doherty's earlier works with text as having more to do with quote a certain mode of looking which is inescapably culturally or ideologically conditioned unquote than with the geography of the location. She posits that quote technologies of the visual allow the fact that all forms of representation are displacements from an assumed point of origin that is henceforth absent and inaccessible unquote. From this she determines that we are, quote, at the mercy of interpretation, unquote, and notes that, quote, whilst representation strives to establish the identity of its referent, interpretation is actually a matter of positioning, unquote. These positions include the artist's decisions concerning framing, focus and point of view when arranging the image to be captured, the language to appear or be heard against the image and the viewer's proximity to the displayed work. Fisher suggests that when these positions have been understood, quote, then the path to interpretation is opened to subjective agency, unquote. To offer an example of such agency, particularly when dealing with memory and media conditioning, it is interesting to note that Stuart Graham, who plays the driving man, would a few years later play the role of the prison officer we follow for much of the first half of Steve McQueen's Hunger, and who is later murdered by a paramilitary gunman while performing a familial duty. Before the driving sequence is already in the film, we view him perform the ritual of checking the car's undercarriage for explosives while his wife looks on from behind the living room window. Given this later performance by the same actor and his similar modes of dress for parts of it, we can see the potential to project narratives and markers of identity back through time and space onto conceptual works such as Drive. Both scenarios involve repetition and, to an extent, a sense of looking but not seeing. The events and characters in both installations call to mind familiar devices, styles and moments in the histories of film, media and popular culture. Rerun is reminiscent of Carol Reed's urban odyssey, Odd Man Out, in which the ill-fated leader of the organisation Johnny, James Mason, traverses an unforgiving post-war pre-troubles wintry Belfast. As noted by Conley and Fisher, Rerun also bears a striking resemblance to sequences in Alfred Hitchcock's thriller North by Northwest. The man in the dark suit whose running is split across two different screens and the exhilaration this causes in the spectator causes to mind Cary Grant's character Roger Thornhill in the Hollywood classic. In a case of mistaken identity, Thornhill is transformed into a double agent by external forces of which he is unaware. His actions and movements are monitored by various parties, but more specifically, he is sought by them. In an effort to clear his name, his conduct causes him to become morally ambiguous when he assumes the simulacrum identity of George Kaplan, a man who does not exist but for whom he has been mistaken. He switches from being the hunted to the hunter. He is in constant transit and must negotiate a range of spaces for the duration of the film, spaces which often exude a sense of constriction even in rural locations. There are even driving sequences where he has been compromised into criminal activity, that is when he must hijack a vehicle and when his captors force him to drink and drive in a bid to eradicate him. Doherty's nameless running and driving men are essentially Thornhill without the backstory. They are simulations of fictional characters transposed into action sequences that are not connected to narratives. Additionally, the backdrop to the opening credits of North by Northwest shows the flow of traffic in the reflections of the windows of a high-rise office building in New York City. 
A similarly compressed view of traffic can be seen in Doherty's control zone, made in the same location as Rerun. Elsewhere, the installation's ambiguous one-word titles and film structures are reminiscent of conceptual and structural film experiments in the 1960s and 1970s. Andy Warhol's Kiss and Eat depict the actions of the titles and refer to the orders given to the participants. In Doherty's case, the verbs also become nouns, going for a drive, this programme is a rerun, and so on. The word drive, as depicted in the video installation, is suggestive only of continuous forward motion with no indication of what was left behind or a point of arrival. There is no starting and stopping, no entering or exiting the car and no apparent motivation, drive, for the journey. The term rerun does not simply refer to the film's replay in the screening loop, but also the actor literally rerunning his course over and over during the production process. This impression of resetting time also calls to mind the premise of Tom Tickford's Run Lola Run, involving a protagonist running against the clock in an urban space without linear time or memory. The sequence in Drive in which the man's eyes are closed evokes Warhol's sleep, which depicts the exterior of a sleeping body as a rejection of surrealist psychodramas that used film to represent oneric activity. While the effect of this kind of image in Drive is similar, its fast editing and the other screen showing the man driving with his eyes open suggests a nightmarish quality. The rapid cutting and wide range of angles employed by Doherty in these works invite a different way of seeing, a more challenging form of witness that relies on the viewer's often unconscious media literacy to generate a meta-narrative. Doherty's camera is usually watchful and pensive or apparently in search of something. For instance, when viewing works such as Control Zone and Black Spot, which comprise fully of long takes, the spectator must unwittingly assume the position of targeted state surveillance. In Rerun and Drive, this more considered mode of observation is denied. Rather than engaging in an act of static, desensitised watching, the viewer is confronted with rapidly changing visual information and having to turn between two screens. The fact that the soundtracks to these installations are silent or minimal means they are primarily intended to be a visual experience. However, this enforced performative element creates a physical experience that generates a physical memory, which extends the work even further. Doherty claims to, quote, often have a particular viewing condition in mind, unquote, and that when showing work like Drive, he aims, quote, to create a feeling of physical discomfort or uncertainty about which of the two images, unquote, the spectator ought to pay attention to when only one can be seen at a time. He states that he is, quote, concerned with the psychological impact of the subject matter with how a particular sequence of images is edited, unquote, and tries, quote, to extend the viewing experience beyond the familiar and passive experience of sitting in a cinema or watching television, unquote. In addition to the discomfort experienced in the exhibition space, the entrance into many of Doherty's installation environments involves passing through a constructed blackened corridor. Where space allows, this will include at least one uncertain corner that must be turned. After passing the threshold, the corridor can be so dark it is sometimes necessary to feel your way, and rendering the viewers momentarily visionless, so much so that it affects their mobility, they become vulnerable and powerless, with no choice but to be controlled by the space and guided by the minimal light coming from the projector and screen. The installation's control over the viewer's physical behaviour marks a change in psychology that is not all that different from the self-censorship many of us perform when we are aware of being monitored, for instance by CCTV. While not unique to Doherty, in the case of showing work such as Rerun or Drive, the tension between vision and mobility that is expressed in the figures on screen is transferred to the spectator and creates an uncomfortable awareness of one's own private experience during a simple visit to a public art gallery. For a fuller understanding of the implications of the actions which are enforced on the actors and spectators, we might consult the Foucauldian model of behaviour in space. In Discipline and Punish, Foucault theorises that the physicality of the structures in which prison inmates are contained is what influences the exercise of power over them and determines their actions. This applies to a variety of scales, for instance, in Rerun and Drive, we can easily imagine the fuller scope 
of the urban settings within which we find the men in transit. However, the limitations exerted on their space by the framing and the repetition of their actions confines them within what Foucault would refer to as the operation of, quote, a microphysics of power, unquote. That is, the bridge and the car, while the car is situated in another microphysical space of an underpass tunnel. In the Foucauldian sense, we can also assume that these men are potential perpetrators as well as victims. The actions of running and driving are in themselves harmless acts, but the actors' behaviours and the ways in which they have been filmed and edited project perceptions onto them, just as the CCTV camera watches with the expectation that transgressions will occur within its gaze. In a way reminiscent of Hitchcock, Doherty's use of film language and space manages to make the unremarkable remarkable and the everyday extraordinary in that these basic actions can be perceived as much more than they are through a combination of mise-en-scene, editing, movement and the viewer's media conditioning. Furthermore, the rapid editing explores the cinema's ability to represent how memory compresses the passage of time, while also visualising the memory's tendency to replay different versions of events. The brief opportunity to register the images in rerun and drive while having to spin between two screens mirrors the on-screen tension between autonomous behaviour and externally controlled movement through space. The fragmented nature of the viewing experience resists the linear passage of time and at once reflects and causes further issues with the functionality of memory. Remembering and forgetting The speed at which the resistance to linear time is demonstrated in Rerun and Drive calls to mind the work of structural filmmaker Paul Sharitz's experiments with flicker effects in films such as Touching and Nothing. These films take the form of fragments that change so rapidly that the shot durations meld into one another as the eye struggles to differentiate between one image and the next. It affects the viewer's perception. On structuralism more generally, Foucault relevantly states that, quote, it is the effort to establish between elements that could have been connected on a temporal axis an ensemble of relations that makes them appear as juxtaposed, set off against one another, implicated by each other, that makes them appear, in short, as a sort of configuration. Actually, structuralism does not entail a denial of time. It does involve a certain manner of dealing with what we call time and what we call history." To consider rerun and drive in relation to this kind of structural film experimentation and certain manners of dealing with time and history, it is significant that Doherty interrogates the notion of film and video replay in works that disrupt and reset durational time. When a moving image document is replayed, the past becomes present again. Rather than deny time, rerun in particular demonstrates some problems with memory in that it is not simply the reanimation of the past, but instead illustrates the memory's mechanisms for generating plural histories. As mentioned previously, rather than reuse the same footage, any repeated shots are in fact retakes and re-performances, making up the two films, which last for 30 seconds and are replayed innumerably in the installation loop. This is evocative of a reenactment as a mode of remembering and memory telling. It is not quite the same each time, there are differences and discrepancies. It is also reflective of how oral histories and stories are rewritten in their retelling, of how an act of forgetting often takes place as points can be omitted and reordered during acts of recall. To return to media accounts of events, the official rewriting of history can invoke a process of official forgetting, which supports the denial of other versions of the past and can present a resistance to a more autonomous and subjective understanding of what transpired. As the works under discussion demonstrate, if external control is exerted over the body's movement through space, then there must also be an exertion of power over memory. The films are similar to how fragments of memory are experienced, for instance when the mind races during periods of anxiety. Memory is not a fixed document in the same way that film can be. While moments from the past can be remembered in varying ways, what happens in a raw film document stays the same. However, film and video can degrade, be destroyed, altered or become lost, while suppressed memories can be triggered and reanimated. 
A film is a memory machine and Doherty's work draws attention to the mediation or self-mediation of memory then the unreliability of memory, testimony and mediated representations are revealed in these video installations. To draw these notions of fragmented time and altered memory back to concepts of space and place, Foucault asserts that, quote, heterotopias are most often linked to slices in time, unquote. He explains that, quote, the heterotopia begins to function at full capacity when men arrive at a sort of absolute break with their traditional time, unquote, and must confront heterochronies or multiplicities of time. The notion of other spaces coexisting with multiple times and how this affects identity and memory is evident in Doherty's repeated use of certain locations throughout his body of work. As indicated earlier, both filming locations and rerun and drive recur throughout his oeuvre, creating a kind of self-reflexive mise on a beam for those familiar with his work. For example, the black and white photograph, Diptych the Bridge, features the Craig Avon Bridge that appears in rerun and control zone, and a photograph entitled Foot Bridge, the West Link Belfast, was taken not far from the tunnel where drive was filmed. The recurrence of these and other locations, such as the Donegal peat bogs and abandoned industrial sites, shows the degree to which the artist's own memories and experiences, including those of growing up during a civil conflict, are drawn to place. This is inevitably reinforced by memories of mediated images and descriptions of certain places and the events that happened in them, not only as depicted in the news and broadcast media, but also representations by other artists and writers, such as T.P. Flanagan, David Farrell, Seamus Heaney and Kieran Carson. Although selective official memory may be necessary for society to move on after many years of conflict, rerun and drive warn against the dangers of being caught in a perpetual loop. The fact that both works depict men engaging in constant forward motion with no start or end points suggests that past anxieties and traumas attached to place are not being dealt with. They traverse the same ground in the same ways over and over again with no real change and no foreseeable future. Since the videos were produced, both Belfast and Derry have continued to experience sectarian violence to some degree and while loyalist and dissident Republican paramilitaries are apparently diminished, they continue to remind the public and authorities of their lingering presences through regular instances of violent and threatening activity. For long-term residents, it does feel at times as if they are living in a kind of relentlessly repetitive loop that is indicated by the video works. Whereas some of the public can remain distant from such activity through a lack of engagement, Doherty activates the spectator of his work, however niche that may be, by making us perform as part of it when we enter the darkened screening space and must negotiate between two screens. In this way, we are invited to question what we see when confronted with two versions of essentially the same event. In the Northern Ireland context, what drive and rerun continue to indicate is the frustration that society and politics are perpetually moving forward but never getting anywhere. More than a decade after their initial appearances, the everymen in these videos represent the continued anxieties and apathies of a society controlled by post-conflict architectures in which forgetting the past while pressing onwards in fact shows a lack of control in the process of moving on. You've been listening to Audiovisual Cultures with me, Paula Blair, reading my essay published in Post-Conflict Performance Film and Visual Arts, Cities of Memory, edited by Desa Raw and Mark Feeden, published in 2016 by Paul Grave Macmillan. The music is Common Ground by Airtone, used under a Creative Commons non-commercial 3.0 license. Episodes are released every other Wednesday, wherever you get your podcasts, with early release when available to Patreon members. Be part of the conversation with AV Cultures on Facebook and Twitter and AV Cultures Pod on Instagram. Thank you so much for listening. Please be safe and be excellent to yourselves and each other. Music